an idea for a short story. I'm originally a, a, a physician. Uh, although I never worked as a physician, I worked as a scientist for 13 years. I am very fascinated by people who are a little complicated. The more complicated they are, the more fascinated I am by them. I sort of slided over into science documentaries, and from there I slid over onto other documentaries. I think every story has its own way of being told. In my filmmaking, I use a lot of reenactment. I often sort of use whatever imagery will make a proper association. The drama was only to enhance the subject of the documentary. It was not personal in the sense that it didn't, it wasn't me. It was really about my mother. People, it is personal. It's, first of all, I had known the story my whole life, so it was not new to me. My mother was a, a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto. She had always promised herself, mostly for her brother's sake, to tell the story. When she got sick, a month later, I made the interview with her. And I made it on film, not on video, because I had no idea what I wanted to do with it. And at the same time, I didn't want to lose the interview, because it was a very personal interview. You see films all the time where there is a narrator, right? Who says you cannot use the authentic person narrating a feature film. Why not? So I went up to the drama section of Swedish television and I suggested making a feature film about my mother's story during the war with my mother, authentic mother, as the narrator. My mother passed away about two and a half years after I made the interview. And by that time, the film had still not started. Shortly after she passed away, the project was shelved. So in pure desperation, I started writing a book based on the same story. And when I was about halfway through the book, my producer managed to get some extra money and we started doing the film. It took three days to do this 100 kilometers between Lodz and Warsaw. The story is very, very um, unusual as a Holocaust surviving story. All uh, happens in a city environment. There, is no, there are no concentration camps, there's nothing like this. Basically the German army, Wehrmacht, to keep about 10% of the, of, of the ghetto inhabitants in the ghetto f for factory purposes. Himmler came with the order to liquidate the ghetto. Some people, it's impossible to know how many, stayed in the ghetto as the uprising was started, started and tried to get out. And among those were my mother. She managed by her brother to be smuggled out of the ghetto as it is in the middle of the uprising. He managed to find someone who would smuggle out the whole family. He bribed someone who was driving a, uh, a, a wounded German soldier. She was lying next to the wounded soldier under a cover. In the end, she and her brother did survive. And we were free, Rudek and I. This was a drama driven or a feature film with documentary elements in it. The film won the Yad Vashem Award, National Film Award of Sweden, in a lot of different countries. She died before the film came.
The Living Room is a play with a documentary basis. Annette Salmander, who is a, uh, a Swedish uh, actress and uh, theatre producer, she came to Israel just to seek her roots or something. She's a Swedish Jewish woman, Holocaust children or Holocaust survivors, and a bomb exploded right next to her hotel. First she just wanted to go home, and then she felt, oh my goodness, I have to do something. So she, so she decided she wanted to do a performance, because she was an actress, with Palestinian and Jewish actors in Israel. The third actress she spoke to was Mira Awad, who is quite well known in, in, in Israel and works at the Kamri Theater in Tel Aviv. Annette and she just had, they just hit it off. She kept meeting Mira over a couple of years. She went back and forth to Israel and every conversation they had, she had a camera on the table. After a couple of years of this, she had a lot of material, but she still didn't know what to do with it. So she contacted me and I saw it and I just thought, wow, you know. Annette and I sat down and wrote the play based on this meeting. Annette had decided from the beginning what they were going to do was going to create a living room for themselves and the whole play they were going to paint the living room. Mira could not get loose from the Camry so we did it in Sweden with Annette and uh, an Iranian actress. Maybe one day we will be able to do it with Mira and Annette and maybe even in Israel, which was the, also one of the ideas at one point. Whenever there are problems in the Middle East, then anti-Semitism increases. You don't feel accountable, we get attacked. Um, in the press or, or more verbally. After the Oslo Accord, it became, you know, much easier. It's, it's very, very strongly related to what happens in Israel. It's becoming easier as a Jew to, to, to live in the West. I think it is important to maintain Jewish life, but in which shape, way, shape or form it happens, I think is future will tell. It's almost impossible to define what makes up a Jew or what makes up a Swede or what makes up a... What is it? What do you do? Is it, is it Christmas that makes up a Swede? I think the past is always a determinant for identity. The difference is that in Israel, as in the United States uh, when it was founded, there is a desire to erase the past. The artificiality is not, in the, is not in the diaspora, the artificiality is in Israel where there was a conscious effort to make a new identity. Identity is always based on the past. Identity in Sweden is also based on the past. The identity all over the world is based on the past. But when you create a new nation, like in America in 1776 or in Israel, there is a desire to take away the past and make a new identity. This is, this is how all cultures live. They, they, they live in a link between the past and the present and the future. This is how societies are built. <laughs>